Good morning. I'm glad that you can take some time to devote to worship. We do have a few announcements to at the beginning of worship today. Uh, we are gathering in person for worship at both Shalbina and Honeywell United Methodist churches this Sunday, uh, February 21. And I believe we will continue to be in person for worship from here on out. I don't foresee, uh, I think we've probably gotten through the worst of the weather. Uh, I don't foresee any other uh, pandemic or COVID related closures in our future. I think we're gonna be good to go from, from now on. So I, I look forward to being able to see uh, people on, on a regular basis. It'll be a very good thing. Uh, part of this is driven by just talking to people and, and checking in. We have a lot of people who have been vaccinated and, and who have recovered. And so I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about the, the safety uh, of doing so. Um, also, if for anyone who is here in the area, uh, an, an invitation to help with the Shelby County Food Pantry. They do need some assistance for people to uh, stock tables, pull carts. Uh, they uh, distribute, distribute food on the first Friday after the first Thursday of each month from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And if you're in, able to help out for any portion of that time, uh, please let me know and I'll get you hooked up with uh, Laura Greenwell uh, who runs the Shelby County Food Pantry. Uh, I think that's it for announcements. And so uh, the reading, oh, one more detail. Uh, this is the first Sunday in Lent. And uh, I am inviting the people who are uh, part of the church to join me. We're not gonna fast from anything this, this uh, particular year, because that seems a little bit hard to do after we're fasting involuntarily from so much. So I'm inviting people to feast with me on, and, and praying together, feast on prayer, so to speak. And, and so I'm distributing uh, these, uh, these are little prayer handbooks, and, and uh, this is, uh, what you find in here are morning and evening prayer based upon uh, the traditions of the church that go back to the early, earliest monastic orders, the praying the hours. And so if I will be handing these out Sunday, uh, this weekend, I will mail one to you. I will uh, get it to you however you, you need me to. And, and then on Wednesdays at noon, uh, so that you can sort of start to get a sense of how this works, I'll be doing morning prayer. I'll be uh, streaming morning prayer on Facebook Wednesdays at noon. Okay. The reading this day comes from uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of humanity who has no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate in the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Every funeral that I have presided over is unique in that the person that uh, I'd have the honor of speaking on, about their life, their faith, is, is a unique person and has a unique family that gathers around them. And the challenge of doing a funeral, at least for me, is always that I don't have enough time to really attend to the uniqueness of that person's life. I don't have enough time to, to sit down with all the family. I don't have enough time to sit with the family gathered together. To sit with the family at a meal as they're remembering a loved one, it's an amazing experience to hear the stories that are told and to watch how people react and, and remember. And so what I've learned to do is I spend as much time with the family as I can. And then, uh, the morning of the funeral, was when this usually happens, I take all of that, and I, 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 I'm gonna pull back the curtain, and I'll tell you what I actually do with all of that. Once I've listened to a person's life and faith and stories, uh, I, I use pretty much the same format every time I get up at a funeral to speak. First, I point out what a gift that person has been. I point out the joy the laughter, the favorite food, the amazing experiences, the quirks, whatever it is, I, I try to make sure people have a moment to remember that this person was a, a unique gift, a God-given gift. Then I acknowledge that they're not here, and that's hard. And, and whether the death was uh, something that happened very peacefully, and, and we're thankful for it, but we're still sorry that it happened or whether it was traumatic, right? But however it happened, like there's still this moment of saying like, this is hard. We didn't want to gather here today. We'd, be, we'd rather be gathering with the person that we love. And then finally, I turn to hope. This is our hope. Our hope is that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are going to be gathered together in this kingdom of God to come. We'll be gathered together with our Lord as families are reunited and made whole once more. Right? That's what I say. You can follow along next time I do a funeral, and, and you'll, you'll follow the pattern. Right? This person is a gift. It is hard that we don't have them. We have hope in Jesus Christ that we'll, we will be with them today. If I didn't have that third part to land on, I'm not sure what I would do, though. Like, I'm not sure what I would do, right? This person was a gift. It's hard they're gone. Thanks for coming out today. Like, I, I, I don't know what I would do, right? I, we, a person is always a gift, right? And, and we can always be thankful, and it's always hard that they're gone, but we got to have that hope to land on as Christians that we gather. And um, I wouldn't know how to talk at a funeral without that. Like, I've done funerals when we didn't know much about the faith of the person, and, and what, I, what I have done is said something like, I don't know much about this person's faith, but let me tell you what our faith is. Our faith of us who follow Jesus, who are gathered here today, our faith is that we will be rejoined in the kingdom that is to come. And, and, right, and that, that's honest, right? I don't know what this person's faith is, but I can tell you what our faith is. The hope that death will, does not have the last word, that sin has been conquered, and that we can look towards a future in which all is made right. Paul writes to his, uh, this, this first letter to the church at Thessalonica, and they know this. He has talked to them about death when he was there, and he has, has moved on, he's starting other churches, and, and now he's sent this letter back to them. And, and they, they've had time to think through all that he had taught them. And as Paul's writing this letter, Timothy has gone and visited and has come back and told him how they're doing told Paul how, how the church at Thessalonica is doing, and he writes them this letter, and he spends the first majority of the letter just sort of recounting the history and how joyous he is, how excited he is, how thankful he is for them, that they have gone, they have gone through the suffering, but they still love Jesus, they still are excited about Paul, and they understand that suffering, you know, sometimes it, it's going to happen as people who follow Jesus, but we're holding on to this joy, the joy of the Holy Spirit, and, and he has written to them, and, and he... He acknowledges, he, he gives them this little bit, the, the, which what I just read, this, this bit about death, talking about death. And, and it seems 
that this is something that is nagging at them. This is something they're obsessing over. It's something that they are worrying about. And so Paul goes over with them again what he has taught them because as he says at the front of this section, he does not want them to grieve as those without hope. He wants them to have that third part of the funeral sermon, right? The person's a gift. It's hard to be without them. But we do not grieve as people without hope. We have hope. And let me tell you about that hope again. And, and Paul launches into talking about this hope, Paul, talking about the punchline for, for any talking about death uh, for our funeral sermon. And he uses some symbols, some imagery to talk about this. And, and the reason he has to do this is, He's talking about something he hasn't experienced. Right? And so he uses a symbol, he uses some imagery, and you, you can take any symbol and push it too far. And what he's doing is say, you know, death, it's somewhat, it's kind of like this. But don't push it too far, but it's also some, a little bit like, like this. I mean, he uses three main uh, symbols here. First, he talks about death. He talks about those who have fallen asleep in the Lord. And that's that's a great phrase. Right? That's a great image. That is something I find deeply reassuring. Like to, to talk about falling asleep, when you wake up after having been asleep, you really don't have a sense of how much time has passed. Like I can only really tell how much time has passed by like assessing, do I feel well rested or not? Right? The idea that we have fall to die, to die is to fall asleep in the Lord is this idea that uh, you sleep until you are awakened again. Awakened, and thinking about who usually wakes you up, right? Family wake, wakes us up, hopefully. Right? And so to be awoken by family in the kingdom of God that is to come. Like, we do not grieve as those without hope, for we don't die, we fall asleep in the Lord, to be awakened again in the kingdom to come. They remember that church at Thessalonica, right? I told you about that. Right? And then he goes on and talks about... Um, that the Lord will come from above and we will rise up to meet him. And this is an image that has caused problems over time because our worldview has changed, like literally how we view the world. A, a biblical, like Genesis, Genesis 1 through 11, biblical worldview is that there is this earth and below the earth are the waters, and above the earth are waters. And that the, the waters come through the sky, and the sky is what holds the waters up. Right? And so rain is, is, is the waters coming through the sky. And that then if you go up, like that's where you're going to find God. You go up to find God, and you go down, and that's where you talk about Satan and, and hell. Like up is good, bad is down, we're in the middle. That's the worldview uh, in first century. And, uh, and so the image, the way that Paul talks about this makes perfect sense that, God, that Jesus will return from up and we will rise up to meet him. And isn't that wonderful? The problem is we, we know a bit more now about world. Right? And Paul can only use the, the, what he can understand, right? And, and so if we were to go back to Paul, time travel back to Paul and say, you know, Paul, if you go up, you're actually going to go up into space and, and you're going to see all the rest of the planets that are rotating around the sun. Like, Paul wouldn't know what to make of that. Like, he just wouldn't understand, right? We have a different worldview now. And so... To say that, that we're, we're going to go up, I, I don't think that that is quite helpful. Right? I, I think the, the thing we could say is that we go forward. Right? It, it's not that Jesus is above us waiting to come down. It's that Jesus will return and Jesus will, will return at some point in the future and we're going towards that future. Right? Jesus is waiting for us in the future and we, we're, we're heading towards that. And so we do not need to worry about what is in the future. And, and that, that to me is at least a, a, a better way to, for, for me to make sense of what Paul is getting at. I'm not looking up to see Jesus return because up is heaven. I'm looking forward into the future and saying in the future that is to come all that is will be remade and be remade right. And that's the best I can make of that. 
I'll tell you when I get there, right? As I said, this is imagery. We're trying to do the best we can to understand something. And the third way that Paul talks about this, make sure to, to just to nail down the fact that we don't fully understand, Paul talks about how this will happen and we don't know when. And that when we think of this, we can think of this like uh, labor pangs, like when a woman is pregnant, you know you're gonna have a child eventually. When? Well, child, children show up when children show up. It is a comparatively new thing in like the vast history of humanity, the fact that people schedule a C-section, right? For most of human history, when does a child show up? Whenever a child decides to show up, right? And that's just, labor happens when labor happens. And that's what Paul is talking about with this, right? When is Jesus going to return? Jesus' return is as certain as the birth of a child and as variable. We'll get there when we get there, right? So he, don't obsess about it. And, and that's what Paul is trying to get them. He, he ends with that image, and I think there's a reason for that, right? You can obsess about when a child is going to be born, but it doesn't change when a child's going to be born. So stop worrying about it, church at Thessalonica. Let it go. Stop gnawing at it, right? Gnawing at it. Like this church has started gnawing at this like a dog with a bone, worrying and obsessing. And maybe it's not the whole church, but maybe it's some of the church. We don't know what Timothy came back and told Paul. But evidently, it was enough of an issue that Paul wrote to them to reassure them, to help them handle their worry a little bit. Now, Paul was not a psychologist, but what he's getting at is something that we have found to be true about how our brain works as we've studied how brains work today. Right? That when we worry, that there is sort of a feedback loop in our brains. Like we, we, if we worry about something, some of us, uh, it starts to feel like worrying about it is doing something about it. And then by doing something about it, we're like controlling it. We're, we're like get, making it better. And, and so we can get stuck in this like feedback loop of like there's a problem. I'm going to worry about it. And worrying about it, our brain starts to feel like that's a good thing. We've done something about it. So we worry about it more. And, and so some people get stuck in this, this, this loop and it gets to be outside of their control. And what Paul tells them Paul tells the church at Thessalonica, and I think Paul, this is equally true for us today, is to encourage one another with these words. Like the three, three things that Paul is laying out, that, that death is, is like falling asleep, and it's okay, you'll be awoken by family and the kingdom would come. Right? And then he talks about, you know what, that Jesus is coming, and Jesus is coming from above, and it's going to work out fine. Those who have died, will, will, they'll go first, we'll follow next, it'll be fine. And then he stops and he says, encourage one another with these words. Right? Remind each other with these words. When you see so-and-so sitting down and she's obsessing about this, you just make sure to stop and remind her. I mean, this is not something to worry about. Let me tell you, remember Paul told us, let me tell you about it again. And then Paul keeps on going and he talks about how it's going to happen, but it's like the labor pangs. You'll have a, the, the, that this will happen in the same way that having a child will happen. It happens when it happens. It's going to happen. It's going to be a good thing. So just relax. All right? And then he ends the, the section saying once more, therefore encourage one another. Build up each other as indeed you're doing. Like the way to help each other when you start seeing each other obsessing about this is to remind you about what I just told you. Right? Labor pangs, it's gonna happen, it's fine. Stop worrying about it, chill. It'll be fine. Tell this better story. Right? This is truly wise counsel. The way to handle worry, the way to handle gnawing at a bone in a way that gets unhealthy and turns into obsession is to tell a better story and to have other people help us do that as well. Are you worrying about, you know, let's, let me tell you about, don't worry about that, tell, tell this better story. Right? And so this is a wise counsel that Paul is offering, that we have these choices we can make, that we can choose to tell these stories again and again. But this is how Paul then wraps up the letter, this chunk of the letter, to help people understand that we always end with good news, right? God has destined us not for wrath, 
but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. That's the good news, and no matter what happens, we have this good news to lean on. And so this section of Paul's letter I find helpful in two, two ways. First, it helps us if we're people who worry and obsess about death. Just read this. Read this chunk of this letter again and again and again. 1 Thessalonians 4 through 5. Right? Just learn that. 1 Thessalonians 4 through 5. Start worrying about death. Just read 1 Thessalonians 4 through 5. And just bask in this image. It is something we can choose to do when we feel our minds going down that same path of worry yet again. That death is like sleep. There's no sense of time passing. We'll be awakened to a family gathered that Jesus will come. It will happen when it happens like the birth of a child. It will be a joy. And just tell that story. And second, with regards to just like general worrying, Paul is showing us a way that we can help serve each other. Paul is paying attention to what can cause this problem, this worrying, this obsessing. And we see how Paul responds. Tell the story of Jesus. Tell the story of Jesus as a response to worrying and obsessing and gnawing at things. Right? Be reassured by the good news. And I know this is something I have to do. Like when I get down, when I, get, I, I start to worry, I am frustrated, I come, come back to the thing that I can, I can tell myself. The story is I follow Jesus. And start just going back to basics. Right? I, I can let my mind go down the path of worry, or I can let my mind go down the path of reading some Gospels. Or I can start thinking about the story of Paul and all he went through. Like I can choose how to direct my mind and be, be reassured that we as people of Jesus Christ always have good news. We are people of hope. We are people of resurrection. We are people who turn towards the future, always remembering. And this is the phrase I come back to again and again. There is no problem that I will ever face that is bigger than death. And Jesus done took care of that. Everything else will just, we'll get through it, right? We'll just get through it. We are people of hope. We don't have to worry. We just choose to tell this good news, to tell the stories of the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, even in these days when worry is tempting and easy, your news is good. Even in these days when there is cold and the weather is hard and we have to worry about vaccines and sickness, your news is good. Even in these days when we can be frustrated and concerned about a future that we don't know how it will unfold, your news is good. And so thank you for gathering us once more to hear this good news, that the future is in your hands, that death is not the end. And help us thus to hold on to this good news day after day until we are rejoined with you in the kingdom that is to come. Lord, we ask that you would bless and guide those who seek to make these days better in service to their communities, to our community. We pray for all those in areas who have been profoundly impacted by this cold snap, praying that people might come together to serve and to love each other there. We pray for all these things as we pray in your name. Amen. Now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Go forth to remind yourselves of the good news, to reassure each other of the good news, doing so in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.